Welcome back to Wireless Without Batteries, ECE 8813. I think this is lecture number five. Um, and we basically have these, this class and then one more on Wednesday before the big Chinese New Year break. <coughs> um, so for the distance learning students, you'll have a homework due at the end of the week on Friday to be submitted electronically. And then on Wednesday, of next week, you'll have homework number two submitted. Uh, we will not actually be meeting next week for class here, so there'll be a nice break in the videos, um, and it won't be until at least the following Monday that I'll post another video lecture. Um, okay, so what have we done so far in the class? We did uh, lecture one was, of course, the motivation and intro to the class. Lecture two, we talked about energy harvesting circuits. There was no lecture uh, on the Friday of the first week of class. There was some review material called the Electromagnetics Review. And then lecture three, we talked about link budgets. Various forms of the link budget equation. And then last Wednesday, We talked more about link budgets. We talked more about energy harvesting, uh, a AVI, yep, AVI, automatic vehicle identification, and then uh, we talked about backscatter communi communications a little bit. Basically, different forms of the link budgets. Continuing on from lecture three, and then we also talked uh, a little about uh, yes, exotic devices, exotic devices in energy harvesting. It was a grab bag le last lecture. <coughs> and then we, we give it a little prelude to what the lecture about today is, which is the waveform influence on energy harvesting. And we're largely going to focus on those power optimized waveforms. How do you shape a waveform so that it transmits the maximum amount of power, particularly at low power levels where we have the most problem? Um, you know, uh, energy harvesting always fails when you need it the most, right? The conversion efficiency drops when there's not that much power to begin with. So <clears throat> that's the key thing that we need to overcome when we talk about this world of Internet of Things and smart sensors everywhere and energy harvesting devices that can do computation and sensing with very little power. So we'll talk a little bit more about that today and how, how to shape the waveform to get more energy through nice good spectral analysis and some background information on that that's just general for any form of engineering let alone this kind of researchy field that we're looking at uh, in this class so let's go ahead and start recall the idea of a power optimized waveform It's a nice acronym, POW. And I always used to explain it at conferences that the idea is, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you could take, if you just go up to somebody and poke them and say, you know, this guy here said, I just start poking him. Every second I poke him. It's not going to do much to him. It'll, it'll annoy him, but it won't do much to him. However, said is a nonlinear device. If I store up that energy and every one minute I sock him upside the head, then it'll be more seriously affected. And that's the idea behind PAL. You play games with the duty cycle and the bandwidth of your waveform to push more power through um, an energy harvesting circuit. And a classic example was if I have in the frequency domain, a certain frequency 
And in the time domain, I have a CW signal that looks like this. It has a, 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 a uniform envelope, we would say. The envelope is sort of the magnitude or the rectified signal of <coughs> with the RF stripped out effectively is what it would look like if you mixed it down to baseband or ran it through an ideal rectifying circuit. I said, well, what happens if you now divide that power out between two components of the same power level, but now separated by, let me just call this variable in here. I want to get it right because this is important. Let's say B separation. Well, that's going to cause a beat frequency in the wave. And the period over which it repeats itself in the time domain, we'll call that T pow. Pow period. And it's basically equal to 1 over the separation bandwidth of the two carriers. And of course the whole idea here is we now have the same amount of power in both signals, both the red and the black signals, but because the power is now concentrated in these peaks, they will get through your classical diode rectifier circuit of whatever form you're using more efficiently than if it was a CW signal. In fact, if you think about it, the CW signal is the worst possible signal you can pick an RF to convert energy from, even though that's what everybody uses because it's the same all the time. And that's generally bad for nonlinear circuits. Okay, so now let's formalize this a little bit more. Before we do, I want to review just a couple things about diodes and maybe talk about diodes in a new light now that we, we understand this amplitude dependence better. Let's take the diode curve. My standard VI curve. This is, how I, this is how I've been drawing it, although I've been kind of a little neglectful. There's also something else that happens with diode that I diodes that I haven't necessarily included on my plot. And it happens way over here. Now, sometimes not way over here, sometimes a little bit over here. And that is that at some point, if you apply enough voltage, yeah. What do you call that area? Avalanche region. Avalanche region, or reverse breakdown. That's another region for it. And this is a fairly engineerable region. You can actually change this with doping and junction sizes and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes the variation, the, there's some variation in manufacturing processes. So every diode has this characteristic about it. But there's a special kind of diode that has a very precisely engineered characteristic. What do we call that in electrical engineering, that kind of diode, where you take you have a very clear reverse breakdown region that's Zener. predictor. Yeah, that's it. Zener diode. And for what I understand, when they go to make Zener diodes, they just make regular diodes and then they measure the reverse breakdown very, very carefully and then bin them out. Like, oh yeah, this one is 10 volts. And they put it in the 10 volt bin. They measure this. Oh, this one is 11 volts. Put it in the 11 volt bin and so forth and so on. There's nothing special about a Zener diode necessarily because all diodes are ultimately Zener diodes. They have a reverse breakdown. It's just that the Zener diode that you buy at the store has a rated level and it falls within a certain precision. <clears throat> okay, so if I were to make an idealized model of the diode, this is often how we model diodes. We have that V capital T, which is the turn on region, the turn on voltage. Not exactly. The same thing as V little t that we talked about last class period. That was our thermal voltage, but they're related. The, 
the higher your V sub T, the, the higher your V capital T, your turn on voltage is going to behave. And then let's call V sub R reverse breakdown. That's the point. And then in our ideal model, this happens so fast that we view it as almost a straight line. And then in this region, we have nothing. And then a straight line up for our turn on voltage. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and do what I like to call an idealized efficiency analysis. For a diode. And what I mean by an idealized efficiency analysis, I'm going to make a couple assumptions here. I'm going to assume the ideal model for a diode And let's say uh, we have rectifying circuitry. That is full wave. And it drives a large load resistance R sub L. So it doesn't necessarily matter what the circuitry is. Uh, let's just say it's, it's one stage, one full stage of a full rectifier. And so with that in mind, <coughs> and we make this large load approximation too to basically say we're not drawing that much power from the rectifier circuit uh, such that whatever we're able to rectify is roughly the voltage that we can maintain DC across this load resistor here. Uh, so let's say that we have a voltage out, out of our antenna, V sub A, and we have an idealized formula we cov covered at the first week of class. We said if you take two times the received power coming into the antenna, multiply it by the resistance. We got this factor two in here too. Take the square root. This gives me the voltage at the terminals of my antenna. And this assumes, of course, that you have an idealized match as well. You basically have a real resistive antenna impedance and then a matched uh, impedance that you present to the antenna. Okay, that's our starting point. And if you have a perfect rectifier, then you should be able to, uh, with, with zero turn on voltage, you should be able to convert this into a DC voltage that's equal to the amplitude of your AC voltage. Put a little squiggle there. So it's highly idealized. There's actually a lot going into this, right? One of the problems with rectifier circuits, as we've talked about before, is that they're intrinsically nonlinear. We know that some of the power that hits a, a, a load is going to, an RF load is going to reflect all back it through the antenna if it's not perfectly matched. And we know that the AC resistance that these devices present themselves to an antenna, uh, if you say they're perfectly matched at one power level, then the one thing I can guarantee is if you move above or below that power level, it's not going to be matched anymore. Uh, and so you're going to reflect additional power. So keep in mind, we're already starting to build in a whole bunch of assumptions. But this will, this model that I'll show you will be a really nice way to just estimate in the ballpark what the efficiency of the conversion circuitry is. And it will allow us to apply 
our analysis and define regions of interest not just for regular energy harvesting but then uh, towards the end of the lecture do energy harvesting with the power optimized waveforms okay so if that's true then the ideal power converted across the load is going to be VA squared over RL. This is a simple DC formula, right? If I have a voltage, DC voltage that has the same magnitude as my AC voltage, and I have it over load resistor R sub L, then I should be able to con convert that much power. And in a perfect world, that would actually be about 100%, right? Now, when I introduce diode rectification with a realistic V sub T, what's the amplitude that I convert in that scenario? Well, it's going to be an amplitude of, and, and truthfully, this could be This could be 2VA. If it's a full wave rectifier and I've added a doubler, I'm not going to bother with the doubling or the quadrupling circuits. We're just going to look at a straight full wave rectifier with diodes. So in this case, VA, I'm going to have to subtract off my turn on voltage. And that's going to be the DC voltage that presents across the load resistor. I square it, I divide it by RL. And that is a more realistic power when the diode is on. When the diode is on, that would mean that ideally my efficiency is going to vary something like this. I should have been able to get this power up here transferred. But instead, I'm getting this power down here transferred. So let me just divide those two to get an approximation of what the efficiency is going to be. Yeah. Or another way to write this is 1 minus Vt over Va squared. So. When VA is less than VT, that's a really easy case to, to satisfy. Nothing turns on, right? When it's equal, you just have enough to turn on the diode and nothing else. And that's when the efficiency is zero. When it hits VT, though, that's when the efficiency starts to climb. And ideally, if VA is extremely large, Efficiency approaches 1, 100% in this extremely simplified analysis. However, something happens before that. We get to that point. We never get to 100%. The best we ever do with our conversion is somewhere around 80 or 90% when we've got volts of power to work with. What happens on the high end of things? We have to start worrying about what? Well, that's reverse breakdown, right? My signal starts to clip the waveform. So I, I turn on the power, and then all of a sudden I've got to worry about clipping. So in that scenario, reverse breakdown, what's the magnitude when VA exceeds VR? Well. In that case, instead of VA minus VT, I've got VR minus VT. I'm kind of hard limiting my antenna input due to reverse breakdown, and I'm presenting that across R sub L. So I use my same DC power law. I say I get this much power. So I got to get this much voltage. I square it. I divide by RL. And that implies that my efficiency looks something like this.
So now what happens? VA, essentially what, it, what this means is that I'm really not able to convert more than a certain amount of power with that clipped diode because it's in reverse breakdown. But I keep putting more power into the system. VA gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you, you fall back down and start approaching zero. So if I could di diagram this out, I would have three regions of efficiency. I have efficiency here, eta. And this is what the ideal model that I showed you is really good about predicting. This is actually looks remarkably close to a lot of very detailed circuit simulations that take into account reflections and idealized performance and realistic diode models that have capacitances in them and, and other things that shunt RF. It, it turns out that this works surprisingly well at predicting this stupid little model that I gave you, it presented in 10 minutes, works pr surprisingly well and saves you about 90% of the heartache but basically there's a region here where VA is equal to the turn on voltage of a diode. Right here, nothing happens. You don't get any conversion in that idealized model. Then you exceed the threshold voltage and you start to come up. And you almost get to 100% if you got a nice diode there, but then you hit reverse breakdown, VA equals to VR and then there's this decay as it asymptotically approaches zero. Now when you add realistic effects for diodes, what happens is that you just kind of get a smoothing effect. There's no hard turn on voltage in that instance. There's that kind of parabolic curve. So you start to convert diminishingly faster with low power levels, but it never actually goes to zero. You get something that's kind of like this. But the three regions are still very evident from, from the curve. So we call this region one, the off region. Region two would be the normal region. And region three would be reverse breakdown. And you know how to calculate these now. You can look at a diode spec and then figure out exactly how much power do I need electrically to excite my antenna to get to those points. So ideally, if you ever wanted to, to build a system, especially if you were worried about conversion efficiency, there are other things in energy harvesting to worry about. But let's say you were doing a high-powered system, a microwave power system, that you needed to send watts of power, kilowatts of power, even megawatts of power wirelessly. You know, what point are you designing for for optimal um, transmission? Well, this is the point right here. This is where you want to hit. Right before you get to reverse breakdown. So you pick your diodes and your antenna impedances and everything such that you operate right there. That way you're at the top of the curve, but you're not quite at reverse breakdown. If you go to a little bit higher or lower, you're going to start to lose efficiency. So it's hard to make a one size fits all rectifier circuit. In some of the, if you've got a really high reverse breakdown potential, then the curve is flattened out pretty well here. So you might have a lot of flexibility to design maybe a little farther away from the reverse breakdown. But there's a trade off, right? Generally speaking, if a diode has a very high reverse breakdown voltage, what does it also have? Less efficiency. Well, it has a lower turn on voltage. There is some linkage between those two. Shocky diodes, for example, have really good turn on voltage, which is why we use them for low power conversion. You might not necessarily want to use them for high powered applications, though, because they have re reverse breakdown voltages of like 3 volts, 4 volts, 5 volts, typically smaller than a 
normal semiconductor diode. Okay, so that's our basic model of the diode. Well, let's go back to power optimized waveforms and what I'll do, we'll introduce some more technical content, concepts on them and then I'll show you there's actually four regions that you have to worry about for a power optimized waveform. Okay, so first I want to define something. Again, this is another simplified model that we can use to predict efficiency and behavior in a power optimized waveform. We call this the square pulse equivalent SPE model. One of the problems with these systems, because they are nonlinear, they're very difficult to analyze. And you can probably write a research paper just by looking at different circuits and rectifiers and uh, you know, putting into it multi-carrier waveforms that have high peak to average power ratio and just observing what comes out of them. It's hard to predict, you can kind of use rules of thumb, but it's hard to predict exactly what comes out of it because they're highly nonlinear you have a very complicated waveform coming in there. There's some transient behavior as well. In fact, that could be one of your project topics if you're interested. If you're an electronics type of person, one of the topics that I'll put on the topical listing is uh, the use of, you know, you can maybe study some unique circuits or rectifier topologies. And if you have access to P-SPICE, has anyone used P-SPICE before? You have? Um, it's, if you, I think I know there are versions of it that are free to download. Yeah, yeah. L, is it, well, I think it was the same version when I was a student in electronics 25 years ago. Um, it's nice to know nothing ever changes, right? And I think there might be more advanced SPICE programs that ECE has licenses to. I haven't checked into it, but you may want to look at the category, catalog of... Um, yeah, yeah, OIT is a catalog of free license software that you can either download or at least have access to in the virtual laboratory environment. So, we're not limited, of course, to only two pulses or two, two subcarriers, right? We can put multiple subcarriers in to make whatever peak to average power waveform we want. And we also have the freedom to not necessarily excite with uniform subcarriers, right? I, I gave you two subcarriers on the, f the first slide that we talked about today. I'm saying is you can actually make a pretty high peak to power RF waveform by adding lots of subcarriers. And they don't necessarily have to be uniform valued subcarriers. It's good to synchronize them, but they could be, you know, you could taper them in bandwidth. In fact, you probably would have to realistically. We're going to talk, we're going to do a little sketch of a proof that explains what is the best waveform to use for a power optimized waveform. Um, and it'll be a result that you've probably seen in a different form before. So in this case, we've got a signal that has an envelope like this that's sketched out so very hastily on the board here. Here's the envelope. And there's a repetition period. We call that T-POW. And another way to characterize this too, another piece of information we want to know is the RMS time width. Call this capital T RMS. The average width of a peak. Okay. Let's see, there's another piece of information we're interested in, and what is the average power deliver delivered here? And that's going to be 1 over T-POW 
times the integral from 0 to t tau of the magnitude of the signal squared dt. So if this is my waveform x of t in time, I square it, I average it over a period, and that gives me the average power. Nothing surprising there. That's pretty much how we define average power. But it's with these three fundamental quantities that I can do analysis with a power-optimized waveform. OK, so how do we do? We know t pal. Here's how you calculate the average power. t pal, we said, was related to the separation bandwidth between subcarriers. So if I look at the signal in the spectral domain, I'm going to see a bunch of subcarriers evenly spaced because of the nature of the waveform. And BSEP is the separation between those elements. It's going to be related to the period of the waveform. So the only thing I haven't defined is TRMS. And TRMS squared is going to be equal to, let's say, hypothetically, that I center one pulse here. T equals 0 co corresponds to the center of my pulse in time, my first pulse. And I have a second one and a third one because it's a periodic waveform. But if that's the case, then what I can do is integrate from t pow over 2 minus t pow over 2 to t pow plus over 2. And I take the square of that t square times the signal magnitude squared. You think of this as like the second moment. And if I, I really need to divide this out by something that has units of energy because I got to integrate with respect to time and I got this signal here too. So we do the same thing. We take t pow over 2 minus t pow over 2 of just the signal energy, magnitude squared of the signal. And that gives me RMS period squared. So it's roughly equivalent to saying, well, this is kind of the, the, the width of my pulse. Real pulses have uh, a smooth transition envelope. They don't rigidly stop unless they have infinite bandwidth. And of course, we can't transmit infinite bandwidth at RF. So then, as an aid, Well, let me, let me ask you uh, a question. So let's say in the frequency domain, I'm going to use, I don't know, eight subcarriers of equal amplitude over band B. Did I draw eight? Oh, OK, I put one more. They're equal separated, B sep is the same. Total bandwidth is B, so total bandwidth is basically N minus 1 times the separation bandwidth. My whole signal spectrum fits in there in the frequency domain. What kind of shaped signal is that in the time domain? What does that look like? It's a shape that just repeats itself in the time domain. Square. Well, it's actually it's a square in the frequency domain. Let's do a little frequency analysis here. Okay. 
So, what if I have an infinite number of impulses in the frequency domain? Well, I heard somebody say it already. Sync. Okay, let me explain it this way so that we, uh, that is the right answer for this. Let's, let's start with this explanation here. So I have an infinite train of impulses. What is that in the time domain? So this is frequency, bunch of tones. What is the inverse Fourier transform of an impulse train? It's a trick question. The Fourier transform is an impulse train. Impulse train is one of the few Fourier transforms that are Fourier transforms of itself. Yeah, wrap your mind around that. If you take the Fourier transform of an impulse train, you get an impulse train. Now, the, the parameters are different, right? The spacing here, delta t, is basically 1 over the delta f spacing over here. So, of course, standard Fourier principles follow. If you take this, the, the fingers and smoosh them closer together, then you get an impulse train in the time domain that's farther apart, and vice versa. So <clears throat> this idea that we're taking an impulse train with B set, B set, and then w if we just kind of ghost in, if this were an infinite impulse train, let me just switch colors so I don't confuse. What I'm going to do is say this is an infinite impulse train in the frequency domain. And that's going to lead to an infinite impulse train in the time domain. And that separation time is going to be 1 over B sep, or basically that's going to become my t-pow. So now I have a box like this. And it's like I've taken a box and I have multiplied it by my infinite impulse train. That way I, I keep just the center components and all the other ones go to zero, right? That's equivalently what I've done in the frequency domain to make these multiple spectral peaks that are collected and uniformly distributed over an interval. I take an infinite impulse train multiplied by a box. Now, if I multiply in the frequency domain, what am I doing in the time domain? Convolution. That's right. That's why you learn convolution. You, you, you learn convolution in the time domain in your undergraduate class because you never wanted to do it again. The teacher made you do these stupid folding interval problems where you've got like triangles and boxes sliding in and out of one another and then and, and they took the simplest possible wave forms they could think of and they scared the heck out of you saying you never want to do this again because it's a, but you don't have to because we've got computers and it turns out that the Fourier transform if you can take Fourier transform the two functions you just multiply them instead of Convolving. Okay, so everybody got happy again, and so I never have to do this again. Well, there are some problems it's actually easier to convolve with, and usually when you involve impulses, that's the only time I can think of where I'd rather do something in a, as a convolution instead of a multiplication with a Fourier transform, right? Because at the end of the day, if you convolve something with an impulse, all you have to do is just drop a copy of that signal wherever the impulse is. It's copy and shift. My impulse is here. I've got this signal here in the time domain. If I convolve them, that's the, that's the output. If I got two impulses, really easy. I just copy there, copy there. So at the end of the day, and I heard, was it you, Muyan, that said sync? Yeah, right. So in this frequency domain, this is a box. In the Fourier transform of a box, where the, in this case, the inverse Fourier transform, it's the same. When you start with one function, you always get the other function. It's a sync function, which means it's one of these things that tails off like this, right? 
So you just plop a copy of a sync down wherever you see an impulse. So at the end of the day, what does the actual waveform look like? The aggregate waveform is going to look like a peak that falls down, kind of wiggles around a bit, peak falls down, wiggles around a little bit, peak falls down. And we have a really nice estimate of, of kind of what the waveform is going to look like. We can just look at a sync pulse, take the RMS width of that, and kind of guess what the RMS width pulse of this pulse train of sinks is going to be. It's going to deviate a little bit, but this is going to get a pretty good estimate of what's going on. OK, so hold that thought. We've been at it for 45 minutes, and this would be a good time for about a 10 or 15 minute break so that I don't violate any OSHA laws or student cruelty laws. OK, let's start back up. Uh, and so to review, we left off whatever effective shape I'm multiplying by in the frequency domain, I am effectively taking the inverse Fourier transform of that shape, whatever that pulse may look like, and I'm simply replicating it in the time domain. And that's interesting because what that means is that what we called TRMS, the RMS width of my pulse, is actually related to the bandwidth here, right? The bigger my pulse, the fatter my pulse is in the time domain, the narrower it's going to be in, the, in bandwidth. The bigger my bandwidth in the frequency domain, the narrower the pulse. And in fact, we can also define this BRMS bandwidth the bandwidth of the whole system there. We default to find it in a similar manner, right? We could say BRMS bandwidth squared is equal to, in this case, 0 to infinity of F minus the centroid. This would be the, the middle, effectively, of the frequency component squared times this time I'm going to take the magnitude of my Fourier transform squared to weight the frequency. And I got to normalize it by the total energy of the signal and I do something like this to do that. Just integrate over from zero to infinity. So you see, I take the square root of that. It gives me an estimate of my RMS bandwidth. Now, why do I have these RMS and estimates of bandwidth and, and time period? Well, part of that is because, you know, there's no such thing as a signal that magically goes to zero all of a sudden. When it goes to physically transmit, I've got to have some way to define it, some rule of thumb. And we could use things like 10 dB bandwidth or half power bandwidth or uh, something like that or some sort of threshold bandwidth definition. This is a convenient way to to define it. Then same as the, with the time domain. Again, I don't have sharp demarcations in the time domain necessarily. This is a way to estimate the width and I don't have to resort to any arbitrary threshold to define it. 10 dB width and time. There's also something really neat you can do because we know that these two things are related to one another. So, in fact, the product of those satisfies the following inequality. It doesn't matter what two pulses that you take. Say, square pulse and the sync pulse, which had a TRMS like that. You say, well, I, I can go through and actually calculate what the RMS bandwidth and pulse period is. And if I multiply those together, the sync function and the box, the product 
should be less than this, 1 over 4 pi. <clears throat> and ultimately, what we want, let's say we are given a fixed amount of bandwidth. are given a fixed amount of bandwidth. So when I rearrange the equation like this, this is kind of what I'm, I'm uh, oh, and I should actually, I got the equality direction wrong. No wonder this is looking so weird. There it is, there it is. Okay, this should be, the product should be greater than or equal to one over four pi. And then when I think, oh, I have a constant RMS bandwidth, I move that over to the right side. This is actually fixed, right? I can't do anything about the number four. I can't do anything about the physical constant pi or the, the mathematical constant pi. And I'm stuck in a certain amount of bandwidth that I have to fit my signal into. So the question is, so basically I need to pick a pulse shape that minimizes this project, product that can achieve this minimum 1 over 4 pi. There's one known quantity of Fourier transform pairs that actually turns this inequality into, or inequality into an equality. There you can actually achieve the minimum time bandwidth product. Do you know what the shape of that pulse is? Has anybody seen that in a previous class or science class? Step function. Nope, nope, not a step function. A Dirac? Turns out, no, uh, because Dirac has zero in one dimension, but it's infinite in the other, because the, the Fourier transform is a constant. There's actually one, and, and it's part of a very famous theorem called the uncertainty theorem. It's a mathematical property, but it has a lot of implications in physics. Okay, let me ask another question. Well, this is an indirect way to ask the question. We talked about one type of function that was a Fourier transform of itself. Can you think of any other functions that are Fourier transforms of themselves? I used to drill my students with Fourier transforms, especially my undergraduates. When I taught, I once taught a communications class and I made sure they memorized like a couple dozen Fourier transform pairs because it's really nice to rattle off examples in class and I would quiz them on it. I'd say, what is the Fourier transform of a box? And the poor undergrad would oh, the same function. So this is academia, right? Everything is a Gaussian. Distribution in your tests, your height distribution. We whip this thing out for everything, and it turns out this has a couple of interesting properties. One is that it is a Fourier transform of itself. A Gaussian is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. Of course, the wider you make the frequency domain Gaussian, the narrower the time domain Gaussian becomes, and vice versa. And it turns out that Gaussians have this magical property. You can show that they are the only Fourier transform pair. Well, th they uniquely satisfy this constant. They may not actually be the only Fourier transform pairs, but they do satisfy this inequality with minimum time bandwidth constant, one over four pi. And it's actually one of the most important results in physics because a lot of what you study in physics, uh, let's say you, um, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, have you heard of that? You basically say you can't know a particle's what? 
Velocity or position at the same time. Velocity or position at the same time. And really what it is is the uncertainty of these delta V and delta X follows some sort of or has spouse some sort of inequality like this. We got Planck's constant and some other stuff. Well, where does that come from? Well, it's because you've got wave functions that probabilistically describe position in quantum mechanics. An electron has a wave function, and it's a function that gives you sort of probabilistically where in X this particle is supposed to be. And it turns out that the momentum, the random uh, uh, probability function that describes its momentum distribution is the Fourier transform of this. And so, the more I know about its position, the kind of more squished I get the, uh, the wave function in the space domain, the broader its momentum distribution is in the, in the frequency domain. And it turns out that if you happen to get a bell curve shaped wave function that's inverse Fourier transform or its Fourier transform will be bell shaped as well and that's how you actually achieve that's the best you can do with this set of equality any other set of wave functions is going to do worse and that's actually where they come up with the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle it's interesting right it shows up all over the place in math and sciences another great place is radar you send a waveform. Let me show you two waveforms you can send in radar. You can send a perfect tone to reflect off of, say, an aircraft. This will reflect back a perfect CW tone. And by studying the frequency of that tone, you can look at Doppler shifts and figure out the velocity of the aircraft. Or you can send quick bursts in the time domain with really short TRMS. This is really long TRMS. You can think of this as a really long pulse. And by looking at the round trip time, you can guess the position of the aircraft. You say, oh, it took five milliseconds for that pulse to go round trip. That means this is so many kilometers away. So the thing is, you can actually guess both pieces of information, but not to an arbitrary p precision like you would like to be able to. So for example, the narrower I make this pulse, the more time resolution I have in position, the less error I have on the position of this aircraft here. However, if I narrow the pulse, I don't have that many cycles of sine wave to judge Doppler. And so with fewer and fewer cycles, my velocity estimate is going to go up as my position estimate goes down. If I lengthen it in the time domain, then the opposite ha happens. I, I lengthen it and my velocity estimate gets better, my precision gets finer, and, but I lose the ability to position the aircraft. Now, of course, here's the problem. In radar applications, you can do something that you can't do in uh, subatomic particle measurements. What's that? You can repeat the measurement without disturbing the system, right? If I take a photon and I strike the, the, uh, an electron and make an observation with the thing that scatters back, then I can pin down maybe position or velocity, but I have no idea uh, what the other one is. And I can't make the measurement again because I've now imparted a new quantum of energy, a quantum of energy to that electron. I've disturbed the system. So I can only make the measurement once. That's fundamentally, I can't re-measure and do super resolution, is what they call it, to, to, to guess the position of my subatomic particle. The nice thing about an aircraft is that you do not disturb. I mean, you technically do, but to some immeasurable precision, you disturb its state 
you know, you flick a little electron, a uh, little photon off of it, and the, the you know, the electron, the, the aircraft doesn't, you know, fall out of the sky mm -hmm. or shoot up into the upper atmosphere. So we have the luxury of making the measurement again, and that's sort of a way to cheat around the uncertainty theorem. You pick a velocity and a, and a width precision so that you can measure both of these reasonably well. And if you just repeat the measurement again and again and again and again and again, you can kind of refine things up to a point. Now eventually the can't do that forever because the aircraft is going to move out of view. It's going to have a change its direction, move to a different spot. But that's interesting because if you think about it, what we like to do is this square pulse equivalent model. This gives us a pretty good estimate of what power optimized waveforms are going to do in these nonlinear circuits. You say, I am going to construct a square wave that has approximate amplitude VSPE, solid square pulse equivalent, approximate time period TRMS. And this is what I use to approximate a PAL waveform. performance in circuits. And so then you can make the estimate that most of the POW power will convert as if the amplitude is VSPE. So there's a, if you average over the entire time, you can say this is VRMS, that's your average power signal. But if we calculate the RMS width, what we're saying in this square pulse equivalent model is that the actual power level it corresponds to the efficiency of conversion for this system is more like T pow over T RMS what the average power is. So this would be the CW power, so the average power. We're taking that power and we're concentrating it in time over this time interval. We assume that the signal here doesn't convert very efficiently at all, so we're not even going to bother to count it. But for my power optimized waveform that has a pulse in this direction, up in this interval, that the average power level is going to be distributed across here. So, at the end of the day, here's how my pulse is going to convert. P, S, P, E, is equal to T pow over T RMS P average. And we said that by that inequality, this is going to be equal to 4 pi V RMS T pow times P average. So these are constants. This is we're stuck with a certain amount of bandwidth to work in with a wireless system. We have control over TPAL. This is basically how far one over the bandwidth separation for the subcarriers. And then here's our average power level. And the trick is to maximize this, because the more any, elect for the most part, any energy harvesting device performs more efficiently 
at higher power levels. What's the pulse shape that maximizes that power level, that square pulse equivalent power level? It's Gaussians. So you think Gaussian pulses do the best job in the time domain because their arm has bandwidth times their time domain product is minimal. So for the same amount, as another way of saying the same amount of bandwidth, I can get the most focusing in the time period and hence the highest average power level. Does everybody under understand that? Okay, so that means it's Now let's talk about how these energy harvesting circuits behave. And again, I'm going to go back to my simplified diode model, and I'm going to define a thing called tau gain. And we're basically, this is going to be, what is the efficiency of a power-optimized waveform compared to the same level of power transmitted CW through a device? And we're going to go back to that standard, super simplified model. Because what we're going to find is that there are actually four regions of interest now when we look at power optimized waveforms. Region 1, Region 2, Region 3, and Region 4. So, Region 1. With our idealized model, in Region 1, neither the POW nor the CW signal, continuous wave signal, sinusoidal signal, nor CW can turn on the diode. And so this is sort of a, a dead region in terms of data. If I want to calculate, let's make P input, this is my input power, this is my efficiency or G pow ratio of efficiencies. This is sort of uh, there, nothing can happen in either of these regimes. So I, I'm not. This is just not a useful region of devices. Region number two is that pow turns on the device. but CW can't. And that, what does that mean for GPAL based on our model? I mean, normally when the diode isn't on, the conversion efficiency for CW is zero, right? So regardless of how good or how bad the power optimized waveform is doing, what's the gain of that system? Infinity, that's right. Let's just put infinity up there. Now in three, this would be the normal operation for both of these regions. Normal operation of the diode. So here, <coughs> V sub A would correspond to V sub T. Over here, then my average, my RMS input value for my antenna is actually the square root of TRMS over TPAL times VR. So there's a nice gap here. So Power optimized waveform can exceed the the average power level can uh, 
where the peak power level can exceed the threshold for the diode, and not VR, that should be VT, excuse me. Then we get over to here, in this region when even a CW signal can turn it on. And in this case, what is the efficiency of the diode? Well, we can write it, right? We can estimate it to be the expected amplitude V sub A multiplied by that gain, power, power, uh, gain factor, T pow over T RMS, take the square root. Remember, we got to square root these because the power level in that region is T pow over T RMS, but voltage is always proportional to the square root of power. So we get some gain here, minus VT squared divided by VA minus VT squared. That should be the ratio of the two efficiencies. I've got to exceed both VTs, the threshold voltage in both instances, but I do a much better job of it up here, which means for low power levels where VA is just hovering above VT, this is a small number at the de in the denominator, and this is a large number up here, which means it should be much less than one in most instances. However, as I increase my V sub A, it matters less and less, right? I, if this uh, converts efficiently down here, and this converts efficiently up here, it's going to matter less and less. So in reality, what happens is that I start off very good up here, and then I slowly decay until I get a pretty efficient uh, diode conversion. And then I get to this region, and this corresponds to the opposite. I get, yeah, this is uh, TRMS over T POW times reverse breakdown voltage. Not the threshold, but the reverse breakdown voltage. And in that situation, I have pow in reverse breakdown. And CW in the normal diode operation. And what happens at that point? Well, I'm going to have to make a little mark. Let's say this is a gain of 1. Anytime gain of power is over 1, that means it's converting more efficiently than a regular diode. When it drops less than 1, that means it's converting less efficiency th efficiently than a normal diode with a CW signal. And that's essentially what happens here. Here I start to fall off the table. And I start to get a depletion. Now, of course, this is all based on the ideal diode model, right? What happens in real life is that you get the exact same four regions, except things just to get a little smoother. This doesn't go up to infinity. This goes up to a finite number. It kind of levels out and falls off like that. Except in real life. But in this region over here, get, power gain doesn't even, you get actually a big gain in many instances, but doesn't mean anything because your overall efficiency is not useful for anything. It's falling off the table. This is where you get most of your gain through here. And then d you get this transition period for normal operation. Now, the other thing I should mention is that when you are adding a whole bunch of subcarriers and you are operating with a very high peak to average power ratio, very small TRMS relative to TPOW, what that means, well, what can happen in that situation is this starts to lower and lower and lower, and it may actually be possible to collapse this region three entirely. You go straight from region two to a, a situation of reverse breakdown where it falls down very quickly. So there's some limit, that's one of the limits you have to worry about in playing with this system, so you may not get 
the full games that you think because of things like reverse breakdown and some other things that need to be taken into account. Okay. I'm going to bring up a paper here. This is actually going to be your reading assignment for this lecture. This is a, a paper by Trotter, published in 2009. This is the very first power-optimized waveform paper. And it's published at the RFID conference. Even though this is a general energy harvesting um, paper, it was actually published at the RFID conference because it kind of gave that, in, potentially gives that inter industry the most um, improvement. They say, well, RFIDs are energy harvesting devices. They work at 915 megahertz. Can we, mark this up, can we get power optimized waveforms to improve an existing RFID tag? They were never designed for this but let's see if the, we actually work with measurements. So if you think, what is a tag doing? It's not just energy harvesting, right? It's got to do two other things at the terminals of its antenna. It's got to detect signals because you can actually send RF commands to an RFID tag. So like, wake up, tell me, give me a handle to talk to you with. Tell me what your identification is. Can I read the contents of your memory? These are commands that you can issue forth to an RFID tag. So you can get it to wake up um, and, and communicate. Then you also, the tag also has to be able to communicate back, in this case through modulated backscatter, which means it's got to have a load modulator circuit on it. And then on top of that, it also has to have energy harvesting circuit. And most of these RFID tags only have one antenna, so all three of these things have to go on during at the same antenna. Okay, so here's the experiment that Trotter set up. First of all, he showed some common, common types of uh, charge pumps and voltage detectors and then demonstrated what a power optimized waveform is. And here's the trick. We have to be able to, to transmit a command on this to actually wake up a live RFID tag, right? So an RFID tag operates at 915 megahertz. This is almost universally true worldwide. There's some tags that operate down at 860 megahertz because this used to be the ISM band in a lot of other countries. Europe had an ISM band that down here. Japan had one down here. But they've since kind of harmonized. I think China's was up here at 915. There's some other bands close by. And most people have kind of converged in later days to 915. And that really means that, like in the US, it's really 902 to about 928 which you can transmit in. So you've got to fit everything in this little 26 megahertz bandwidth for the most part that you want to do. <coughs> and of course, if you're transmitting CW, that's not a problem. You're energy harvesting CW for RFID. That's just a little tone. There's going to be some information that you modulate at a low data rate when they're down to the RFID tag. So you have to be mindful of that. You don't have to worry about the reply of an RFID tag because an RFID tag is not an active emitter. It doesn't transmit anything, it just reflects. So most regulatory agencies consider RFID tags to be no different than like a fluorescent light or a piece of an electronic circuit board without an antenna, something that can modulate backscatter but doesn't necessarily do it. And, and therefore, since it's not adding any power to the, to the scattered waveform, It, where you're, you're safe. You, you don't have to worry about the rules. So, the way that an RFID tag sends information to a tag, first thing it does is it powers up with CW. And then, after a certain period of time, it allows the tag to charge up, and then it starts sending a command. 
Well, this is the tricky part. Like, you have to send ones and zeros to send a digital command. So you would think, well, well you know, why don't you just, you know, some, s transmit uh, a full power waveform and then a zero waveform and then a full power waveform and then a zero waveform, and you'll get the tag to to wake up. Well, that's actually not a good thing to do for a couple reasons. First of all, an RFID tag doesn't bank power. So what we call a passive tag does not bank power. It means that the res it, it, it's got a capacitor bank on board that charges up with DC power from the energy harvesting circuit, but it does not save enough power to go a very long time without constant input on the, on the RF antenna. It could if you wanted to, right? Remember, an RFID tag is just a CMOS circuit. It's a CMOS chip. They built it on silicon. And what's the problem with capacitors? If you want a lot of capacitance on a CMOS circuit, you've got to use more and more area, right? If you use more and more area, that means your chip gets bigger. If your chip gets bigger, you can fit few of them on a wafer, right? How do they make silicon uh, chips for RFID? You, you set the masks up, the lithography masks and all. You put in your wafer. You etch out all the devices and dope all the transistor gates and metalize everything that needs to have metal on it and all the circuit pathways. <clears throat> and then you got to slice it up into 50,000 RFID chips. Well, you pay per wafer at a semiconductor foundry. So the more devices per wafer you get, the, more, the less the cost of the tag. And if you use more capacitance, you incorporate more storage capacitance on the RFID tag, then you get fewer devices, and at the end of the day, you get fewer. More. So there's a really interesting nanotechnology decision you make about your chip that has this direct impact on the margin that you make when you send, sell billions of these things. So for that reason, the, the capacitor bank for DC storage is kept intentionally small. You can maybe survive a couple of bit cycles without power, but after that, then th there's not enough to go an entire message transaction without power on an RFID tag. So that means a couple things. First of all, you can't modulate simple on-off key because that's going to break your system, right? So instead, they use something called pulse interval encoding. P-I-E, pi. Because everybody likes pi. And that's basically where you have uh, an, a one is encoded <coughs> with like a, a, let's see if I can do this. A full period, I think, is a one. And then if you want to send a zero, you get a half one period. So here's one bit period. Here's another bit period. So one is transmitted, zero is transmitted. Even when there's a zero, the amplitude is such that I still get half of my period. I'm getting power to the device. So I can still survive a bunch of zeros sent during the command, and it doesn't kill the tag and require it to wake up without any memory of what's been going on. You know, it's like being in a car accident. If you lose power during the messaging transaction, the, the uh, RFID tag wakes up again at the end with amnesia. Like, oh, was I, was I trying to, was I part of a process for singulation? Was I supposed to get in line and tell everybody what number I had in my memory? I don't, I don't know, I'm starting all over again. So that's one problem. That's one reason why we use this pulse interval encoding. The other issue is regulatory. And the one thing I didn't draw here is that when you go to zero, you don't actually go to zero. The, the, the uh, reader is still transmitting a little bit of power. 
And the reason for that is entirely regulatory. When you are, the, the FCC in the United States, the regulatory inform, the agency that determines what's allowed to transmit and what's not allowed to transmit, for unlicensed devices, they say, you have to stay within one watt into your antenna. You can't transmit more than a watt. But of course, these are information signals. They've got highs and lows, right? I said, well, OK, you can transmit more than one watt, like instantaneously, but the average has to be less than one watt. So they have this thing called average conducted power. And they say you can actually average over a bit period or multiple bit periods to consider your average power. However, you're not allowed to average the time that your signal is off. So if your transmitter oscillator or an amplifier shut off, you're not allowed to carry it. So just by leaving a little bit of transmit power here, you're allowed to count that as, and, and such, sort of use that to balance out the other part. Okay, so then, back to the paper. The problem is, pulse interval encoding is pretty easy to figure out when you've got a CW waveform. When you have a power optimized waveform, like I've kind of illustrated down here, well, what does that look like? And this was really the whole trick. This is where Matt Trotter got very lucky. He was a Georgia Tech PhD student. He now works for GTRI. Because it turns out, one of the reasons why we use pulse interval encoding also, and not just like a phase modulation where you're changing the phase of the thing, is because the detector for an RFID has to be very simple. In fact, really, there is no difference between a detector and an energy harvesting cir circuit at the end of the day. A non-coherent detector and an energy harvesting circuit. An energy harvesting circuit converts RF power to DC to use it for something. A detection circuit con converts RF power to some sort of estimate that's kind of in DC, and it uses it for information detection. They're optimized differently with different electronic values, but they perform a lot of the same thing. So when we say a non-coherent detector, we're talking about something that really could just be, again, a diode and a capacitor. This is hooked up to an antenna. You're basically rectifying a signal, trying to get some sort of DC voltage here. When that voltage gets high enough, then you say, voila, I've got a high state. If it drops below a threshold, you say, oh, I have a low state. And it really has to, the only difference could be really what kind of diode you use here, what kind of capacitor do you use here. Use a bigger capacitor than an energy harvesting, slightly bigger. <clears throat> and uh, the diode doesn't have to be quite as low threshold. But for the most part, you're doing the same thing. Well, it turns out that they've adjusted the time constant of the RC in most RFID tags so that when you send in and power optimized waveform signal. So here's my example of a high, low. Most of these are optimized so that the envelope detector just traces right over top these big peaks. And so it can still read these digital commands coming from the reader. So to go back to the paper, Matt Trotter did for to measure this was he had the following setup. Okay, here we go. Blow this picture up here. So you see every a reader, here's a horn antenna. This is taken at a Georgia Tech RF lab. And here's a, a sniffer antenna made out of toilet floats copper toilet floats that they used to sell in the United States. It's a cheap way to make a broadband antenna. And this is hooked to a receiver. Here's a styrofoam block, and here's the RFID tag. So what they would do is initiate a query command. Query is one of the first things you issue to an RFID tag. 
It's a series of ones and zeros that are pulse interval encoded. In this case, it's on the power optimized waveform. And it basically says, give me a random number. And then it, the tag generates a random number with the CMOS circuits and then wiggles it back with a few other uh, overhead bits, a little startup sequence, and then it wiggles it back. And so the, here's the experiment. We took a regular tag. We took an alien squiggle tag here. Here's the, the block diagram of the setup. This is one of the most common RFID tags in industry, 915 megahertz. It's got a ha uh, meandered half-wave dipole, inductive match with this loop at the bottom. And you see right where I got the circle here? That's actually where the chip goes. And here's our transmitter. We measure the power out of the transmitter, and then we variably step it up or down, <coughs> depending on what, how much power we want to transmit. <coughs> and we're mixing into our local oscillator at 915 megahertz an envelope signal. This envelope signal has our, our query command on it, and it also has the ability to generate either CW or PAL. And then our sniffer receiver here, all we're looking at is, does this generate a response? And, it, and then we can correlate that to the power level. So we start up at a little, little power level. Is it, does it generate a response? Let's start with CW, okay, negative 25 dBm. Nope, we don't see anything. Well, that's good. Tags don't turn on at negative 25 dBm anyway. Step up, step up, step up. In the year 2009, we probably didn't get anything until we were about negative 17 or negative 18 dBm. That's how sensitive the chips were back then. And then we see a query coming back from the CW waveform. And so we find the lowest level that you can turn a tag on. Then we repeat it with a power optimized waveform. We use two subcarriers, four subcarriers, six subcarriers, etc. And we found that you could get about up to 2 dB or a little bit more, 2.5 dB of extra sensitivity out of an RFID tag, get it to turn on at slightly less power in 2009, thanks to this power optimized waveform idea. It was kind of interesting because we knew it would work better for energy harvesting circuits, but there was a lot more going on in RFID tag. In fact, we, it's still difficult to go inside one of these devices and figure out why is it failing? Why is it failing? Because you don't know is, is it because I was not able to get enough voltage converted. I wasn't able to get enough power converted by the power optimized waveform. Another issue is that power optimized waveforms have a lot of ripple to them because they have these big surges. The actual DC output can have ripple. And some logic gates, especially in RFID tags, are sensitive to ripple. So it could actually be the ripple causing a problem. Or it could be the detection. Maybe after a certain threshold, I just can't detect the startup sequence. I may have plenty of power and plenty of voltage, plenty of, you know, plenty of high quality voltage to run the chip, but I simply wasn't detecting this power optimized waveform with my diode detector. But it was an interesting first, uh, first cut into getting a um, tag to respond with the real power optimized waveform, multi-sign type waveform. And there were some other researchers in Portugal working at the same time, about the same year they published that, well, you know, if you have two readers or three readers in the area, the tag range actually increases because they, it's a, almost a similar effect, right? If you have multiple transmitters, each transmitting CW, but they don't happen to be on the same frequency, then you get these beat frequencies, constructive interference in time, and that tends to convert a little more efficiency, efficiently. This guy named Carvalho, I believe it was, was looking at this uh, in uh, Portugal. And he called it the multi-sign approach. Put a bunch of transmitters transmitting CW and get improved behavior. It's all been recently within the last seven or eight years. There's still a lot of researchers active into using this to kind of enhance the range of these low power devices. It's probably your next homework. I'll give you some problems on this. 
calculate uh, some power optimized waveforms. Maybe see if you have uh, access to. I won't do it on the next homework, but I'll see if you have access to uh, the free P Spice. Maybe look to see if you can download a copy of what was it, L Spice? Free T Spice. L T Spice. Yeah. L T Spice. I remember that. So we might apply that to a homework at some point. Any questions? Well, that takes us conveniently to the end of our lecture. It's now 2.51 p.m.